Welcome to the wrong side of the bed. I'm Economicon, and things have been rather distorted lately. Um, how do I explain this? I have this weird condition. I've had it for a very long time, really. There's some days when everything seems to be against me, bending in my direction and surrounding me. My vision gets obscured by a layer of oozing mucus, and breathing becomes an unreachable goal. On these days, people take an alien appearance, their faces contorting in impossible ways. It's a grueling feeling that no therapy managed to treat and no pill managed to cure. It doesn't come very often. I feel it at least once a week. But when it does, my world comes crashing down. Um, I making any sense, Meek? Today is one of those days. I know you said you don't experience it very often, but once a week does sound like a lot. The surface of the button is freezing cold, and the remains of my chin make my fingers slippery. Through much struggle, I manage to button my shirt, and with that, I finally finish changing my clothes. I look at my image in the mirror, making sure I look somewhat presentable. My clothes are neatly ironed, resting on my body miserably. My hair is a mess. My dog ears refuse to join the rest. I never paid him much mind, so it'll do. My face is nothing more than a convulsing mess, moving around and twisting sporadically. I don't want anyone to see me like this, but I never have the choice. I look at the time on my phone, 8.14am. I've got time. I should hurry downstairs and eat something before I leave. If there's any consolation, it sounds like you're the only one that sees your face moving sporadically. The way downstairs felt needlessly long. The stairs extended under my feet. I take a moment to catch my breath. My legs almost fail me under the weight on my shoulders. I close my eyes, trying not to get the mounting flesh in my eyes. I adjust the collapsing pieces of skin on my face with my hands. I don't know why, I've just suddenly got reminded of, um, Reaper the Genetic Opera, when it's just about Paris Hilton's character just trying to hold her face in place. Nearby, I hear the clinking of dishes. A moment of silence. Then faint footsteps approaching. Oh, oh, your face seems to be convulsing as well. Do you need me to try and rearrange it? You look like you've got two pupils in your left right, right eye. I think it's the right eye. Morning. Slept well. Who is this? A man of big stature approaches me. His face forming a disturbing shape. It rotates more and more upwards, letting out an almost rubbery stretching sound. My gaze is fixated on his face, but my mopping eyes lose focus. Gathering the energy to greet him cheerily seems pointless, so I don't even attempt it. Morning. Made some scrambled eggs for breakfast. Are you coming to eat? I'm not hungry. Really? I think you should. I'm not hungry anymore. There's a sharp pain in my stomach. The thought of eating makes me nauseous. Ever since I came downstairs, my will to eat has vanished. And seeing his disfigured face surely made me lose my appetite. Okay. What's up with you? Are you feeling well? I yeah, it's just... Oh, wait. Is this about the, um, face thing? I nod apprehensively. I'm not sure what he understands by that, but I don't feel like explaining myself further. You know, would it help if he put a mask on? So I'm just thinking, it's only really his face with visible features that has altered, right? Like his clothes and all the d details on there remain the same. So if we just got him to put on a mask, maybe that would help? I start heading towards the door, grabbing my coat. Wait! He heads towards me in a hurry, and pulls me into a tight embrace. 
His warm, throbbing skin makes contact with mine, leaving a running goo on my clothes. The air is suffocating. An intense scent of boiling blood is making me ill. Just above my head resounds a familiar voice, but making out any words is impossible. And yet, the feeling is almost comforting. My head is resting on his chest. It feels soft and warm, and his grasp on me is not very tight. What is he doing? Why is he doing it? This display of compassion. Why is this stranger showing it to me? What's the point? These permeating thoughts ruin every good emotion I could have gotten. I don't see why I should feel anything good. All I can do is wait for it to be over. And soon enough, it is. His arms part ways from my body, and I take a moment to recollect myself. Shortly after, I resume my way out. So wait, when I'm suffering from this, um, condition, does it affect my memories? Because we're clearly struggling to identify him, right? I hope you manage to feel better. I'll make some popcorn. Maybe we can watch a movie when you return home, okay? At this point, I'm already with my hand on the doorknob, and his mass of moving facial features drops a little. All right then, see you later, me. I love you. It's a cloudy morning, but the lack of sunlight leaves everything looking gray and stale. That is, since all of the sunlight goes right into my softened eyes. It hurts. Birds are chirping. Their choir makes for a long, continuous song of screeching sound. I can almost hear distant cars. But looking around, I can't see anyone. I'm not sure if this must be a blessing or a curse, as nature continues its bullying. I look at my phone, trying to make out anything on the dark screen. 8.19am. For a moment, I see a reflection on the screen that I would hesitate to call my own. I often struggle to link this person to myself. I bring my hand to her face. I don't feel being touched. A strange, slimy substance falls down my hands. It's my eyes. My eyes are melting again. Sight becomes a struggle. I fasten my pace as if the inertia will keep them in place. Oh, I think I just walked into something. Something standing in my way brings me to a rough stop. Dizzy from the impact, I drop to the ground. No longer at the alarming pace, my eyes solidify back into place. My sight returns to me, and I start making out a figure. Oh, are your face even more spoiled than the last guy? Meek? Well, hello there, neighbor. Jeez, where are you headed in such a hurry? Who is this? A woman stands before me seemingly not affected by the collision in the slightest. Her face swirls to the center, skin flowing in a vortex like a storming river. It makes a whooshing sound, and I can almost feel a breeze coming from it. I'm not gonna lie, that is one awesome face. Sheesh, you look a mess. Did a car bring you over? Okay. But really now, did something happen? You don't look very... You, I guess. I'm fine. I just... Woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I merely mutter those last words, hoping it makes for a good enough explanation. My voice is already becoming nothing more than a blabbering noise. I get up on my feet, brushing off my clothes a little. She closes her mailbox, holding some letters in the other hand. <laughs> yeah, I know how it is. It's fine. Make sure to make your morning coffee first, and you'll be good to go. You can add some caramel too. That's one of the few good parts of being barista. Right? I'd love to see how that place is doing. 
can't talk. I've really got to go now. I'll catch up with you. I say my farewells in a rush, just before my voice becomes illegible. And once again, I am already on my way. Um, okay, rude. Another fast-paced walk, and I finally arrive at the bus station. To my relief, there's no one else besides me yet. I take a seat and bury my head in my hands. It makes a loud splosh sound, stopping on my hands without a care. Through the small space between my palms and my fingers, my eyes melt and extend to the ground. Stop that! I think to myself, but the blob of skin and organs does not care. She was right. I am not looking very me right now, as if I wasn't already self-conscious. I'm being rude and ignorant and uncaring. No, that's nothing like me. Well, I mean, that defense, we were massively rude to the neighbor. I mean, clearly we were already in a hurry, right? That's why we ran into her. So she should understand that we're in a bit of a rush here. Ever since I woke up, I've been turned into something that doesn't even resemble me. Time and time again, why do I keep feeling like this? I grab my face tighter, pulling it down. It stretches with no struggle. It hurts. It's not my fault. It's because of this. This. But that's just another poor excuse, isn't it? This act of harming upon my face is just another act of hiding. Hiding an image of myself. I am trying not to disrupt. Because of this condition, I am displaying a person that is not me. The image of a distorted meat that is trying to stain my flawless life. Is this what I'm trying to tell myself? Is this my excuse? Maybe I'm acting like this because this is what I am. Maybe this caring, sociable version of myself I long for is all just smoke and mirrors. And it's only now that my collapsing lips cannot flash a smile and my face is taking its real form. And I know that my real image is of someone who is rude and ignorant and uncaring. Someone who doesn't deserve compassion. Um, that's a little bit harsh on ourselves. We're just having a rather bad day. Listen, no one can be cheerful every single day. Someone who doesn't deserve love. A cruel person. A jammed toy. I forcefully pull the hand from my face and hit it on the wall of the bus station. It makes a loud sound that echoes and the small space trembles a bit. The rush of pain breaks my line of thought. A long-lasting pain is left on the back of my hand. I look at it for a moment. The area looks slightly bruised, but there's no blood coming out. It didn't hurt enough. Oh, I highly recommend us not using pain as a distraction point. That sounds very self-destructive. A heavy room sound approaches, and the bus soon arrives. I allow the other people to exit, then I get up myself. I show the driver my bus pass, noticing him briefly looking at the back of my hand. The bus pass is quickly scanned, and I go looking for a seat. The bus is not very crowded, and most people seem to prefer sitting alone just like me. Through the double seats mostly occupied by one person, I find ones that are free. They're not in the best shape, but I'm not in the position to complain. I take a seat, just flowing in the air as I do. I rest my album on the windowsill and place my head on my hand. My face once again mounts down my neck, almost mocking me and my inability to keep it in place. I tell myself a quiet prayer, hoping it gets better before I arrive. You know what I'm curious about? How do we perceive ourselves to look when our face is mounting off? Like, do we become rather skeletal? Or is it just going to be like a smooth, featureless complexion? I'm, I kind of want to see it. There's no way 
I can look like that in front of customers. No way I can act like that either. I try to cheer myself up, but any happy memory seems to leave me on days like these. So I just stare out the window, spacing out, trying not to think of bad things either. And so, the hours pass. Oh, I feel very watched right now. A mass of eyes and mouths melt into an incomprehensive mess. They approach the counter in a messy fashion, stumbling over its own contorting form. I sit at a distance on the left, staring at the gruesome formation in horror. Only a handful of eyes approach me, but they leave before I know it. In a slight panic, my own mounting face seems to fade from my worries. I'm not here to worry. I'm here to make coffee. I'm the coffee boy. I try to humor myself. It doesn't work. The amalgamation makes loud noises in front of my co-worker. A girl, barely the same age as me, with indiscernible facial features. Some mouths extend to her, but she stands just barely out of reach. It's a usual sight. I don't even bother to act surprised. She is the one, good with orders. The one who recognizes loyal customers and has their usual order ready before they reach the counter. The one people like to talk with. The one people look for on her free days. For that reason alone, seeing the pair of eyes on her makes me feel slightly bitter. People are just naturally more attracted to her. I bet she has a lot of friends. I bet she talks to people often. I bet she puts a lot of value on how she looks. Perfectly brushed hair, not a single stray hair. All in vain, if her face can't even be seen. I bet that's all people see in her. Under the sterile aspect, she is just as rotten to the core as the rest. I bet he is just as scared. I bet he is just as lost. I bet her face doesn't fall apart. I bet he has his struggles too. I bet her friends don't think she's a burden. I bet there's some good in him as well. Wait, so we're getting two different perspectives here, right? I bet her boyfriend doesn't hate her. I bet my life would have been better if I was a girl. I bet people would have liked me more if I was a girl. I bet I would have looked better if I was a girl. I bet I would have been more appreciated if I was a girl. I bet I would have been more loved if I was a girl. I bet if I would have been happy if I was a girl. I bet I would have been happy if I was a girl. I bet I... Can I get a cinnamon latte? A stray mouth floats towards me, breaking my erratic line of thoughts. Yeah, of course. Coming right up. I say the line almost automatically. My face bounces up and stretches into what I hope is a smile. I turn around, picturing the instructions as I go. I just hope the goo dripping from my face doesn't end up in the drink. I could go for a smoke by now. And so, the hours pass. And before I knew it, I was on the bus, heading back home. The melting excuse of a face is hanging weightlessly. I can almost hear it snore. Faint light radiating from the window feels much less violent. Singing a bird no longer hurts my ears. Has nature grown to be just as tired as me? Or have I simply been spared of the mocking for now? The present moments start to fade away, becoming a mush of sticks with the rest. Just like that, another uneventful day has passed. Nothing noteworthy even happens at the coffee place. I did everything I could to end up somewhere far different from this. I tried my very best at school, 
I passed nearly every test with flying colors. I graduated high school and I went to college. I've got my diploma and that was it for me. A diploma and some charm did not suffice for a better cog placement. And just like that, my summer job meant to help with future student fees became a dirty steeple in my life. With the way things are, I can't help but regret the fun times I did not get to have. I can only hear stories of the parties I never had the time to partake in. They all merged into one very genetic movie plot, with everyone reduced to a caricature. Just a bunch of people gathering to drink and hug up and jump from the balcony and die and die and die and die and die! So, maybe turning into a nerd for a few years wasn't such a bad decision. What the hell used to happen at your parties? And after a long hiss, the bus stops. The scenery outside, albeit alien, looks very familiar. This is my stop. I quickly get up and head through the door. I walk around the empty street. I am the architecture of the houses. They are all technically the same, but each has a small touch of humanity. Small decorations sprinkled around the yard and windows. It gives them a personalised look. This is not my street. The bus has left me at a further bus stop. In the evenings, when my work hours end, the bus won't stop at the station close to my house. How bothersome. I never managed to figure out why. I want to reach home soon, but walking is becoming demanding. My face dissolves loudly, extending to my feet. It hits my legs, making me almost trip, and its weight makes movement difficult. I pant in exhaustion. My sight is getting blurry. A cacophony of sounds surround me. I can almost make out a laugh. Eventually, my pace slows down to a stop. I clench my fists. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. A grueling feeling is building up in my chest, and tears start forming in the corner of my eyes. You know, coming to a complete standstill was probably our first mistake. I mean, it's so much harder to get started again if you actually stop. You should have just shuffled for a bit. I don't know if I should scream or shout or cry, but it seems the mounting flesh has decided as clear laughter surrounds me. A loud voice is mocking me to no end. It exclaims everything I fear to hear. You are a burden, worthless, unlovable. What good is a jam toy? I recognize the voice as my own. I cover my ears to no avail. The voice rings throughout all of my surroundings. What have I done to deserve something like this? What makes my being so rotten as to deserve such treatment? That is the cruelest part of my entire condition. To be so mean to myself. To be so cruel to myself. To distort my view on people. To make me go through such suffering. I am the worst. I am mean. I am cruel. My view on people is distorted. Everything I do leads to suffering. You know, this thought path here, when we establish ourselves as being cruel in this, this is probably what leads to this own condition. It's probably like a self-fulfilling cycle, right? Like, we'll have this condition which will make us feel bad, so then we'll be negative against ourselves. And by being negative against ourselves, we'll loop back around, forcing us to go back into this condition. For all this pain I've caused, I am deserving of this torture. I will mutilate my face until I am unrecognisable. I will cover up the things I look up to. I will destroy everything I don't deserve. This is my punishment. This is why my face is distorted. This is why I go through this. My family. My friends. My lover. A person like me doesn't deserve them. A person like me doesn't deserve to be happy. A person like me doesn't deserve to be
to live in all of this noise. I hear a faint giggle behind me. Not of ill intent. Its amused nature makes it distinct from the rest. I turn around, my face accommodating just enough to make it possible. A gentle breeze is blowing in my face. My surroundings do not resemble that of a street any more. With the rest of my power, I lift my head and look at the source of the sound. Before me stood a stranger I knew all too well. Hey, your face isn't messed up. Well, 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 look who we have here. You? I haven't seen you around in a while, Meek. How long has it been? Don't give me that crap. I don't want to hear you right now. Wow, aren't you a ray of joy? You must be fun at parties. Well, apparently everyone dies at parties, so I'm the life of them. I'm kidding, of course. What you doing? Anyways. Going home. Really? I'm going home too. Isn't that funny? Hey. Why don't we walk together? We're going the same way, so we might as well. Whatever. Come on, it's getting dark. Hey, wait up! Where are we? Oh, so now you feel like talking. Just say it. Hmm, well, I don't know either. Do you reckon this is us as a kid, maybe? I mean, clearly we're not actually in reality right now. I don't remember getting here, to be honest. But look, there's houses right on the horizon. We'll get there in no time. It's so far away. Yeah, I guess. But I don't worry about that. As always, the moments will fly away before we even realize. How? How? Can you be so sure? Huh? I don't get it. This distance between us and everyone else. It'll take forever to pass. How can you think it'll be so easy? How can you be so careless? It's impossible. It's way too far. We'll never make it. You, who is this cruel and worthless? What makes you think you'll ever reach them? You're stupid. Over every bad thing you've ever been, you're also stupid. You'll be better off remaining here. No one needs you back there anyways. Yeah, perhaps you're right. Perhaps I am cruel and worthless after all. And perhaps I must be stupid for thinking I'll make it. Oh, oh god damn. This is definitely us as a kid and I how I feel bad. And yet, this entire time, we walked. Oh, how yeah! We were fairly optimistic as a kid. And even if we haven't reached it, don't you think it looks even just slightly closer? Huh? It does. And maybe I am stupid thinking like this. But if we keep walking, eventually we'll both get home. What you're saying? I don't get it. It makes no sense. You think so? I thought I was pretty on the nose there. Fine. Let me try something else. Let's say you're watching TV. Are you changing the subject? Be quiet for a moment. Let me get my thoughts in order. Okay, so... You're watching TV, right? It's a nice Saturday night, and there's this cool movie you want to watch. You get ready for the night, you grab a snack, and you sit down to watch it. And right when the action is at the highest point, there's a commercial break. It sucks, right? It takes you right out of the movie. That's what you get for not getting the ad-free plan. Or, you know, just buying the DVD. 
That works as well. I mean, yeah, but that's not the worst part of it. While the thousand of sponsors tried to get you to buy their junk, you look around the room, and you remember that there's no one sitting next to you. That's the loneliest feeling you could ever feel. Nope. I don't agree. I'm sorry. I... I don't like watching movies with other people. Uh, but they're just... I get distracted. I, I get interested in how they find the movie and their responses to it. And then I don't pay as much attention to the movie. It's like going to the cinema. I would much rather just go on my own. I'm going for the horror movie. Can you tell I'm not the most social person? <laughs> I'm sure you know that feeling well. Okay, now, let's say there's someone with you on the couch or the bed or whatever. Anyone you get along with, really. And so, you ask them about the movie. Do they like it? Wasn't that scene so cool? And you talk about what you think might happen next. And you laugh at the dumb jokes you two are making. Just like that, the commercial break became much less lonely. It passes fairly quickly, and you're back at watching the movie. But in that moment, you can only think about the commercials and the silly things you told them during them. How great it feels to be with them, and how grateful you are that they're watching the movie with you. Wait, you no, you've just proven my point. We're now so distracted by our conversation with this person, we're no longer paying attention to the rest of the movie. We have now just ruined the movie experience for ourselves. I don't know why I'm so passionate about this. And maybe, just maybe, you start to wish for another commercial break. I... I don't get it. Who are you talking about? Gosh, and you're saying I'm the stupid one. The person next to you can be anyone. Family, friend, roommate, long lost brother or pet. It's less about who they are and what you do. It's about the good feeling it gives you. In front of the TV screen, when you're not missing on the movie, you're allowed to laugh, bend or even cry. But the best feeling is to have someone you can do all that with. You knew, didn't you? For the longest time, I couldn't do any of that, because no one was next to me. Am I talking from a place of pure euphoria, or from the place of intense loneliness? Could it be that they are one and the same? But that's alright. I was never one to dwell on the past. I want to only look forward, to appreciate those who are sitting next to me and keep talking during that one important scene. Because in the end, it's not about the snack or the movie. It's who you're watching the commercials with that matters. Speak for yourself, kid. I'm there for the horror movie. So, for my undying gratitude towards those dear to me, as long as this beautiful dream of mine will keep going, as long as there's someone next to me on the couch. As long as TV ads will keep ruining the scene. I too will be someone deserving of love. You ramble a lot. <laughs> Guilty. But I hope what I said made some sense this time. I'm not gonna lie. I might have got distracted from your original point. By getting so focused on the movie aspect. I... I think you were telling me that it's just nice to have people there. That, that'll that be my takeaway from this situation. Just not doing movies. Thanks for listening to me, me. Hmm? That name doesn't really belong to you, does it? Then... What I should be saying is... Thanks for listening to me, Max. Wait. Max? Wasn't that on our co-worker's name tag? You're welcome. Hey, look how close the houses are. 
See, I told you so. I can almost run towards them. What are you? He began running towards the buildings, almost tripping with every couple of steps. I don't try to chase after him. Instead, my walking comes to a stop. I watch him get farther and farther as my surroundings are getting darker. The sun is barely visible and my fixated vision is starting to lose the figure in the distance. He is strange. That's the only way I can put it. And right now, I can't think of better insults. As the street lights turn on, I start making my way home. For a brief moment, I consider if I'd rather watch a comedy or a drama tonight. The end. The commercial break is over. The movie hasn't even begun. Even when the credits roll, will you stay by my side? Use his name. So wait, if I actually put Max in here, will it change the game? Max, is that you? Yes. Uh, how do I explain this? I have this weird condition. I've had it for a very long time, really. There's some days when everything seems to be against me, bending in my direction and surrounding me. My vision gets obscured by a layer of oozing mucus, and breathing becomes an unreachable goal. On these days, People take an alien appearance, their faces contorting in impossible ways. It's a grueling feeling that no therapy managed to treat and no pill managed to cure. It doesn't come very often. I feel it at least once a week. But when it does, my world comes crashing down. Am I making any sense, Dylan? Uh, kind of. Huh? I think I get what you're saying. Maybe I should have noticed sooner. Don't you think it's weird that there's something wrong with me? Well, I don't think it's normal. But I don't think there's something wrong with you. Really? Yeah. You know, I... I never told anyone about this. I know it's weird. I know it makes me look crazy. On those days, I don't feel like myself at all. I end up saying and doing stuff I don't actually mean. That's why I wanted you to know. No matter what, try to reason with me. I just don't want you to think I hate you. So, when I start acting weird, please, don't hate me. I can never hate you, Sunshine. Thank you. I really needed to hear that. And thank you for everything. I really don't know what I would do without you. Hey, it's all right. Let's just go to sleep. I love you. I love you so much. I love you too, Max. Please, don't cry. Life keeps its never-ending flow just outside the glass door. A thin layer separating the urban noise from the stillness of this coffee shop. Besides a couple people at the tables, this place is mostly devoid of customers. All things considered, today is a slow day. I briefly huff in amusement. This is great. I love being paid to do nothing. I'm bent over the counter, resting my arms on it and holding my phone. I have to be in my spot in case someone comes in. My co-worker is in the back, talking loudly over the phone. I can't discern how the conversation is going. With this moment of quiet, I decided to do the least peaceful thing I could do. Check social media. 
with Instagram open. I log on to my secret account that's totally just a bot. Jessica Hart, 18 plus only. Check for nudes. Huh, interesting account you've got there. Let's see. Today's excuse for online stalking is... I was curious how they're doing. Then again, why come up with an excuse if I go through all of this trouble? I might be even more petty than I thought. Anyways, let's see how the lives of people I went to high school with are going. Cocktail at the beach? Cheesy selfie? Engage? Picture of a dog? Cute. Pregnant? Married? Group photo with people I don't know? Pregnant again? Married, 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 married. Jeez, why is everyone getting married right now? Good for them, but that's a lot of weddings at once. Of course, everyone is only posting the good parts of their life, and social media is fake. While I am caring too much over other people's lives, I hear the slight creak of the door. A customer came in. I put my phone in my pocket and straighten up. As they approach the counter, their face becomes very familiar. Is that... Oh, is that neighbor, right? Well, hello there, coffee place employee. Curly, what are you doing here? Is that how you're talking to a customer? This is outrageous. Worst service I have ever got. One star of you on Calp. I'm kidding, of course. I'm gonna visit a friend, and since this place was on the way, I wanted to see how it's holding up. Of course, you would have known that if you weren't in such a hurry a few days ago. Oh, yeah, about that. Don't even worry about that. I'm sure you had your reasons. But anyways, looks like the cottage aesthetic is still holding up. How's being a barista going? I space out for eight hours and pray I don't poison anyone. That's the spirit! Get as few free weekends as possible, and one day you might get a raise. We both giggle briefly at the improbability of that happening. Her amusement fades away, and she starts eyeing the displayed menu. Actually, weren't there supposed to be two baristas at a time? Where's that girl you were working with? Maxine. She's in the back, on a smoke break. Oh, you can't share the name. That's cute. Is that why your label reads Maxwell? Yeah, they have to use our full name. But the staff calls both of us Max anyways, so... It's kind of a doozy. Uh-huh. Well, I suppose it makes it easier. I mean, all you need to do is just uh, put a note on the counter saying call out for Max, and one of you will answer them. Bit enough of that. I came in as a customer, so I might as well order something. I could go a third coffee of today. Oh, that a go, Kelly. Get that caffeine. Third? Yeah, third. Come on, you're here to make coffee. Not to judge me my caffeine intake. Fine then. What would you like to order? <laughs> I could go for a... A tall latte macchiato, sure. Oh, a new soy milk instead. Sorry, ma'am. The soy milk is unavailable at the moment. What was that? Was that an automated response? Whoa, I guess so. I didn't even mean to say that. Well, you know damn well that doesn't work on me. Bring me the soy milk, coffee boy. I really shouldn't. The manager... Actually, why does the manager make us say that? That's the thing. No one knows. It's fine. He never noticed the difference. Fine, but if I'm asked, I'll say that you threatened me at gunpoint. Cool. And you will be investigated by the police and considered a criminal. Fine by me. And you will be locked in jail for at least ten years for threatening a poor defenseless barista. 
Is my coffee coming or not, coffee boy? Yeah, yeah, coming right up. And so, I start the preparations, grabbing a pack of espresso beans and a carton cup. I also get the soy milk, hidden behind cartons of milk just beyond a customer's sight. See, if the manager really didn't want to serve in soy milk, we wouldn't stock it. Kelly begins to talk about her job as a fashion designer assistant, about all of the great suggestions she comes up with, and the fools she had to work with. I let out a short comment from time to time, but most of my attention goes towards the coffee. Even these small comments are the most casual talking I've ever had with a customer. I don't remember the last time she set foot in this place, after she quit her job here. She worked as a barista here for a while, before I came into the picture. Two years into college, and absolutely squeezed of money, I got my job here and met her as a co-worker. Even now, I'm not very fond of talking with my co-workers, but Kelly was nothing like that. She had to train me and explain how everything worked, so we spent a lot of time together at work. When I was feeling down, she would say some jokes no one else found funny. Luckily, we ended up sharing the same dumb sense of humour. In general, she's someone fun to be around. I pour the coffee in the soy milk and hand the carton cup to Kelly. Wow, you even managed to froth the soy milk like I taught you. They grow so fast. That will be $4.95. Oh man, are you sure you can't make an exception? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Unless I will upcharge you for the soy milk. Pay up, Kelly. Four ninety-five. Yeah, I'm kidding. Here. She pulls out a five-dollar bill. Grabbing it, a one-dollar bill is revealed just behind it. For oh, your exceptional performance, copy boy. Go buy yourself something nice. Even after getting her copy, she stays at the counter, having lots more to share. As the place remains mostly empty, I keep listening to her stories. She tells me the newest gossip, and I gasp in disbelief. I ask her about her boss, and her ramblings become frantic. She's one of the few people I get to talk to like this. In a lot of ways, she reminds me of my older sister, before she moved out to her own home. As a little kid, her stories about high school and being teen felt like a fantasy. I can't remember the last time we taught like this. At some point, Kelly checks her phone, a look of surprise being plastered on her face. Crap! Might have drunk the latte a bit too slow. It was nice catching up with you, Max, but I have to go. See you some other time. Oh, and tell Dylan I said bye. Okay. With a request not out of the ordinary coming from her, Kelly rushes her way towards the door. I feel a little more lively after talking with her, but in the end, the place is still empty. Does no one want coffee today or what? I sigh and pull my phone from the pocket again. And so, the hours pass. Ending my shift happened later than it should have, but in the end, I left the coffee place. I hurry my way towards the bus station. I check the time on my phone, again and again. The bus will be at the station in a few minutes, if I'm fast enough. I should be able to make it. Just as I'm about to take the corner, a heavy broom approaches, and the bus zooms down the street, just past me. Crap! I watch it get further and further, as if that'll bring it back. Oh, don't tell me that was our last bus of the day. Ultimately, the reality that I have to walk settles on me. The sun is on its slow but steady decline, so right now is as good of a time as ever. I start my way on foot. And so, the ten minutes pass. The weather today is nice. The clouds are covering the sun, 
covering everything in a slight darkness. Sounds of an urbanist nature fills the air, and a slight breeze blows from behind me. If memory serves, I must walk five miles until I get home. That's not so much, right? I feel a faint vibration coming from my pocket. I check my phone and see a notification. It's from Dylan. Where the F are you? Ah, oh, I'm late for a couple minutes and he starts to worry. That's me. Left late. Missed the freaking bus and now I have to walk. Oh, okay. Stay safe. Also, Kelly said bye. Okay. Another interesting conversation with the driest texter ever. All his messages are just as deadpan, no matter his mood. I'm gonna laugh if one day he just blows our minds and adds an emoji. He works as a web designer, so he already spends all day in front of a screen. After that, I guess the last thing you want to do is use your phone more than needed. The lucky bugger also works from home, although that only leaves him with more housework to do. Between the two of us, he is the one that does most chores, cleaning, cooking, a house husband indeed. I try my best to provide my help where and when possible, but for the most part I can't. Even so, I do my best to support him however possible. That's what a lover should do, right? Right now, I really don't have anything better to do. It's time to space out and talk to myself again. Wait, did we not at least bring some headphones with us? To pass some time. How about we go over everything again? As a child, even before my condition appeared, I wasn't very good at befriending boys at the age. I was disgusted easily. I wasn't interested in sports and was scared of anything that could hurt me. I was easily dismissed and considered too feminine. Some were even calling me a very ugly girl. One day, my mum let me ride my bike on the street, close to my house. I wasn't very good at it yet, so I fell off and it scraped my knee. A group of boys ran towards me and helped me get up. Their leader, a chubby kid, felt bad for me and helped me on my way home. Dylan was in that group. Back then, the others called him Dilly, and I thought that was funny. From that day, they would knock on my door and ask my mom if I could hang out with them. Mum was proud that I finally made some friends and would encourage me to go outside with them. They would walk far from the neighbourhood, smash bottles and throw rocks in the river. My girly aspects never went away with them, but they didn't seem to mind. The leader is very kind for a boy, Dilly told me once. I didn't think. He meant that in a good way. Even then, didn't have some sort of macho complex, which never fully went away. Slowly, the group would help me learn to bike, holding it straight while I pedaled. It worked, but in the end, it was in vain. At some point, with no warning and no reason, my condition appeared while I was hanging out with them. Their faces began moving, stretching into forms far from normal. I was horrified. I ran back home crying, hidden under the covers, sobbing with no signs of stopping. I heard words I shouldn't have. Why are you crying? What reason do you have for crying? Those are not your friends. Friends are not something you deserve. In my child mind, that voice was the most terrifying thing to exist. I feared the thought of hearing it every day. For a while following that day, I isolated myself from the world. I was scared to see people, scared that their faces would take on a scary form again. The group came to my door almost daily, but no matter how much my mum asked me, I couldn't face them ever again. And, slipping through my fingers, my most beautiful years passed me, never making friends again. I met the leader on the street at one point, in my teen years, more mature looking and still a little chubby. 
He told me that the group got dismantled when Dilly moved away. After a short talk, I never saw any of them again. Until adulthood. Kelly took me on a walk one day to meet with a great pal. A guy she knows from college. I was less than excited to meet new people, but she insisted that I needed to see new faces. A couple streets away from my mum's house, but pretty close from Kelly's, she knocked on the door of a plain looking house. And Dilly was there. I didn't even recognize him. He looked nothing like his kid South. He spoke to Kelly with an annoying relative, but he spoke with me with a shocking familiarity. You don't look different at all. Meeting someone I knew before felt incredibly strange, yet comforting. We bonded again fairly quickly, and me and Kelly ended up visiting him often. First, it was me and her. Then it was only me. First, it was for maybe an hour. Then, it was the entire day. I was getting way too comfortable, way too fast. You hang around here so much. Why won't you just move in? He said it in a joking tone, but the idea was seeded somewhere in my mind. The house had a guest room he wasn't using, so why not? It was about time I moved out of my mum's house, but getting a house on my own was pretty much impossible, so why not? But the truth was so much more than that. Before reaching that point, I have developed a huge crush on him. He always let me be around him. He was sweet and caring and never pushed me away. I never had a crush before, so I wasn't sure if that was it. It felt like nothing before. I didn't accept it as simply physical. In a way, I wanted him to fill the void that was left by all the loneliness I had to endure. But I knew he couldn't. Time and time again, I had to go through all of his stories of his many girlfriends as a piece of my being chipped away. I felt revolted of what I am and what I was feeling. I was reminded that what I am is not normal. With that, another idea was left cemented in my mind. I wish I was a girl. And yet, our plan came to fruition. I became accommodated in his house fairly quickly. I helped with bills, and we would take care of individual chores. He was the one that handled the cooking, as he soon found out that mine is... Crap. Yeah, let's just call it as it is. I wasn't sure what I wanted anymore. To live casually with him and forget about my crush? Or to watch him from up closely, like the creepiest kind of stalker? I didn't want to do this to him. I didn't want to do this to myself. You know, it seems almost cruel on our own part to move in with a guy we've got a crush on. Especially since we've clearly not established whether he reciprocated our feelings or not. I settled on a decision. I'll tell him. I'll ruin everything and we'll have to deal with what comes next. And, on a restless night, in front of a TV no one was watching anymore, I poured my heart out to him. He had an unreadable expression on his face. But then again, I was too ashamed to directly look at him. I was prepared for yelling, but nothing came up, which was so, so much worse. But after a long and ending minute, something weird happened. He pulled me closer and told me how much he cares about me. I don't think I was aware of myself anymore, but in the moment, with his hand on my cheek, I inched closer and, and from that point on, I became his sunshine, and he became my world. I fell asleep in his arms that night, tucking at his shirt and crying on his chest. Something inside of me broke, but it felt like a good thing. My first crush, my first relationship, my first kiss, all these feelings I've never experienced before. Someone chose me. Someone decided that I'm good enough to them. Dylan 
is so much more than I could have ever asked. If he thinks I'm good enough, then I'll trust his judgment. If I'm good enough to be loved, Oh, we're back in our field. Kid, are you still here? As I bring my attention back to the road, I find myself in an unfamiliar location. There's a gentle breeze blowing in my face. My surroundings do not resemble that of a street anymore. Someone is in front of me, clenching their fists and shaking violently. Around them, I can hear faint words I can't make out as they let out barely audible grunts. I find the sight inexplicably funny, and let out a small giggle. Wait, we've swapped placements now, right? So I'm gonna be the one that leads... I wonder if they're still gonna be called me. Well, they're not, because they don't realize that's the name anymore. I wonder if that is our first character, though. The person lifts their head towards me, and begins turning around to face me. Before me stood a stranger I knew all too well. Oh, hi. That's what the mounting face looks like. I kind of look like a pufferfish. Maybe I've just had an extremely bad allergic reaction, and, and then my eyes melted. Well, well, well. Look what we have here. You. What are you doing here? I haven't seen you around in a while, Max. How long has it been? Why do you keep saying that? You're such a weirdo. Hey, calm down. Calm down. I really don't get why you're so surprised. Come on. Let's get to walking. I don't want to be here until it gets dark. I'll explain everything on the way. Fine. So, how's it going? You weren't supposed to be here today. Sheesh. Getting right to the point. You know nothing stops me from getting here. So why shouldn't I? You know why. I really don't. Enlighten me. Today is not one of those days. Oh. Oh. Is that why you were whining so much? <laughs> That's hilarious. Don't touch me. And what's so funny about it? I'm sorry. I just think it's funny how much you worry about that. Oh, man. I was hoping that after so many visits, you would realize. You can be really dense sometimes, Max. Believe me. I have so many other things I could have done instead of being here. But I don't do any of them. Want to know why I come here on all those nasty days instead? I come here to see you. Why? You know why. You know it very, very well. You knew all this time, but you refused it. You looked away and acted like you forgot. Don't say it. I come here because I care about you. I care about us. I am you, and you are me. The state of our faces does not matter. No. No, shut it! I don't want to hear any of that. And because of my condition, you forgot that we are one. You became someone separated from my name. All this time, you've been antagonizing me. You called me worthless and cruel and someone that doesn't care. You don't care. I don't care. But I do. I do care about you. You don't. You never cared about anything or anyone. You're the worst and I'm the worst too. I hate you. I despise everything about you. All these words I thought about myself. All these distortion I've left in my way. What have I done to deserve this? My life was amazing. My family loved and accepted me for the natural thing I am. I have a caring friend. I have a wonderful boyfriend. I did my best and my best only. Why? Why do I have to go through this? Please. Tell me, please. 
I don't want to go through this anymore. I don't want to doubt myself. How can you care about me when I can't even care about myself? It's so weird. Everything is so weird. Make it stop, please. Save me. Save me before I feel even lonelier. I'm trying, you know. No. No, you're not. I came here to save you. Then why do I still hate you so much? Well, it's because I am you. No. But you forgot that, and you mistook me for someone else to blame. Tell me, Max, just how many of your words were actually meant for me? I know how you feel. That burning hatred that you lay before you and wait for someone to take it away. And yet, no matter how far someone takes it, somehow, it always comes back to you. That's because you always end up wanting it back. Because your hatred was the only thing keeping you company. You're trying to hate anyone else, so that you won't only hate yourself. No. No, that can't be it. I don't. Well, I did say it was a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of deal. Please, don't leave me. If you leave, all I'll have is this hatred. I know. I know. This need to hate someone has only submerged you in loneliness. And loneliness that, no matter how many people have around, never really goes away. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want you to feel like this. I'll help you get better. I'll save you. How? Well, that's why I'm here. That's why, time and time around, I come back here to see you. I know what you're going through. I know that no matter what you do, these feelings will never go away. But I can always stay by your side. I can always be there when you need someone. I can hold your hatred. I can assure you that you are kind and that people really do care about you. I'll love you for as long as it takes for you to love yourself. I'm sorry. I've been so cruel to you. It's not me who has to forgive you. You must forgive yourself. I know that you will because you are kind. I... I'll try. I will. I... will. I will. I will. Hey, look how close the houses are. See, I told you so. Are you going to run again? Nah, my legs are hurting more this walking. Let's go home. Together, okay? Okay. We make our way to the street, side by side. None of us knows what to say anymore, but maybe that's for the best. I look at him as in a mirror. Wondering who I was really comforting just now. Maybe I wanted to convince myself that a part of me is still worth saving. Maybe I wanted to make him feel better. Maybe I wanted to make myself feel better. Maybe I wanted all of them. Maybe I wanted to go home. I step on the cold asphalt and the other me is nowhere to be seen. I start making my way on the empty street, my path illuminated by the streetlights. The sun is barely visible, hidden behind the horizon. The faint sound of crickets fill the air. In a few days, I will get worse. In a few days, I will get better. I'll despise myself, and I will comfort myself. I'll love myself more than I hate myself. I'll do my best and I will get better. It's me who has to make that change, for the sake of everyone I care for. I'll try. No, I will. I will get better. Eventually, I reach the doorstep. I lay my head on the door. 
I've been walking for far too long. I'm exhausted. I try to recollect myself. I don't want to feel down anymore. Not around him. I grab the key and insert it into the keyhole. That's enough of feeling down for today. It's about time I feel cheery again. I unlock the door. Honey, I'm home. I shout in a jokey manner, practicing my less serious tone. As I free my sore feet from my shoes, all my senses start getting attacked. The well-lit living room contrasts intently with the streets. My eyes take a moment to adjust. The smell of cooked onion permeates the air. The sound of some kind of drama on TV is slightly obscured by the clanking and boiling from the kitchen. Speaking of the kitchen, a figure is peeking from the doorless kitchen entrance. Oh, hi, buddy. It's nice to see your face intact. Look who finally decided to show up. Ah, oh, if it isn't my lovely house husband I've missed so much. Stop calling me that. But I missed you too. Looking away, he goes back to whatever he's doing. I did miss him a lot. But I didn't mean it fully when I said it. I just wanted to hear him say it back. It washed away any bad from my day. And it fills me with the comfort of home. I approach the kitchen, resting my shoulder on the entrance. I notice the pan on the stove. A sauce is boiling as he's chopping chicken into chunky pieces. He's actually wearing the apron his stepdad gifted him. So things must be serious. So... What's cooking? Chicken curry, since I haven't made it in a while, but I'm actually trying some things this time. Oh, how so? Well, this time, I want to actually try to... cook. Yeah. What? So all of those awesome meals of yours were... takeout? No, of course not, but... I mean, as I learned to cook in college, I didn't have the resources or money to do proper meals. Just following recipes and not caring about the taste all that much, you know? So I'm basically teaching myself to cook again. Adding more spices and looking for tips online. Oh man, I've left you alone for so long, you've gotten bored. No, it's not that. Now that I have the time and the money, I really want to make better food. So, uh, just partially bored then? Maybe. Well, I'm certain I'll be even greater than before. Now, you're truly becoming the best house husband there is. My world. Thank you, sunshine. I'll take a little more time, but I've left some lunch in the fridge for you. Thanks, but I'm not hungry just yet. I'd much rather feed an annoying you. Now that I'm home. Well, get ready to start because you could never annoy me, Max. Oh, well, aren't you just the sweetest? I fully made my way into the kitchen, rest of my arms on the counter. In truth, in front of him are spices and greens I hardly ever see him use. Hey, hey, you better not use all of them at once. It will feel the taste for weeks. Huh. Of course I won't use all of them. I'll just try a couple at a time. At random? Pretty much, yeah. So, what if it doesn't taste good? Then I'll add some more and hope that fixes it. That's... Hey, cooking is about exploring, right? I mean, someone had to have mixed up stuff at random to discover curry. Fair enough. I mean, baking is the one that has to be more precise, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, and if the end result is completely inedible, I'll use this as a learning experience for the next time. You know, seeing you so passionate about something makes you harder. Um. <laughs> you like to be all strong and manly, but you blush really easily. <laughs> Just bothering you as I do. So, can I help you? With what? 
With cooking, of course. No. Eh? Not even a little bit of hesitation? I appreciate it, but I don't need your help. Ah, oh, come on. I promise I won't add way too much salt this time. That's the least of my worries. Jeez, I know my cooking is total garbage, but now you're just being mean. At least I never started a fire in the kitchen. The answer is still no. Also, is anyone else kind of concerned where we had to specify starting a fire in the kitchen? Have we started a fire at some of the place in the house? I'm going to guess the bathroom. Please? No. Pretty please? Nope. I dare you to let me help you. Nah. Double dare you. Stop it. Triple dare you. With the chicken or chop, he lets the knife down and pulls me into a hug. In the intense smell of cooked onions and meat, I can feel the familiar scent of his faded fragrance. It's comfortable. I hug him back and drown myself in the feeling. Through all of the way, he could have shut me up. This is the best one. He pats the strands of my hair, pointing up. Dog ears, he insists. Hey, you're getting the chicken smell all over my hair. How about you go upstairs, change your clothes and rest a little, and pretend you go shower out the chicken smell. I'll let you know when the food is ready. Okay. After a couple more moments, he kisses my forehead and lets me go. As I'm told, I go upstairs and get ready for the night. Today has been a long day. Maybe I really do need to lay down for a moment. The rest of the evening was nothing special. It didn't need to be special anyways. We ate dinner, talked about whatever of the day, watched some TV and went to bed. And there I was, laying in bed, staring at the ceiling. As if, once I fell asleep, I would wake up from this wonderful dream. Or maybe, I just wanted to listen to the sound of the night. I wanted to feel the weight of his arm on me. I get so lost in thought sometimes, that I forget how the present is flowing in every direction. The past has stained me, and tomorrow might be one of those days. But right now, right now is perfect. This is perfect. I want to take it in, to acknowledge all the things I feel, and all the love I've shared and been given. And with that thought, my eyelids start to feel heavy. Well, that was sweet and sad at the same time. And I know this is basically the same... I don't know if it's prequel or sequel, but it's in the same vein as Face You Less. So it'd be rather sad if essentially when we woke up the next day after this, that is when the entire events of Face You Less occurred. Well, I hope you enjoyed your time there. If you did, please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. But other than that, hope you have a spooky day and I'll catch you next time, guys.